Hello everyone, this is a reading of chapter 11 of Terence Deacon's book Incomplete Nature. The chapter is called Work. Work. What is energy? One might expect at this point a nice, clear, concise definition. Pick up a chemistry text, a physics text, or a thermodynamics text, and look in the index for energy, definition of, and you find no such entry. You think this may be an oversight, so you turn to the appropriate sections of these books, study them, and find no help at all. Every time they have an opportunity to define energy, they fail to do so. Why the big secret? Or is it presumed you already know? Or is it just obvious? H.C. Van Ness, 1969. Forced to change. The theory of emergent dynamics that we have outlined in the previous three chapters does not in any way conflict with the basic principles of physical dynamics. Indeed, it is based almost entirely on well-established pre-20th century physical theory. However, there is an interesting way that it can amplify and broaden these principles to extend it into organizational and intentional realms that have until now remained mostly disjoined from the physical sciences. In this chapter, then, we will re-examine the common notions of energy, power, force, and particularly work, from which these other concepts are abstracted, in an effort to understand how they can be generalized and reformulated in emergent dynamic terms. It took the geniuses of Galileo and Isaac Newton to show definitively that neglecting the effects of friction Neglecting the effects of friction, objects moving in a straight line will maintain their velocity and direction of movement indefinitely, so long as they are not affected by gravity, impeded by collision, or otherwise forced off course. And as a result, constant rectilinear motion is now understood to be equivalent to being at rest. It tends to persist as a spontaneously stable pattern of change. A thermodynamic system in equilibrium is also in continuous change, even though at a macroscopic level it appears to be unchanging. In this respect, it is analogous to an object in constant undisturbed movement. Extending the analogy, we can likewise compare the interactions of differently moving objects to the interactions between thermodynamic systems with different specific heat or energy levels. The differences in relative momentum when the objects interact result in accelerated changes in their motions. The differences in total heat or energy contend between different thermodynamic systems at equilibrium can translate into changes to both if brought into interaction. These correspondences form part of the bedrock on which classical physics was built and later found even more subtle expression in relativistic and quantum theories. How much things change from what would have occurred spontaneously is a reflection of the amount of work exerted to produce this change. So long as contrograde change persists, work is involved, and thus it can accumulate over time and distance. The amount of change also reflects the amount of energy exchanged during the transition from the prior condition to the changed condition in the interaction. Energy is related to the capacity to do work, irrespective of whether it is exhibited in the collision of two masses or held in the electrical potential compressed into the covalent bonds of a hydrocarbon molecule. As we have discovered, however, the concept of energy is remarkably difficult to pin down. This is in part because it is a notion abstracted from the concept of work. In one sense, it could be considered merely a way of balancing the books. It is what has not changed in any physical change, spontaneous or not. Work, on the other hand, is intuitively more tractable, as it is directly reflected in the extent of non-spontaneous change that results. And unlike energy, the capacity to do work does not remain constant. This is what we intuit when water has drained downhill and we can no longer use its motion to turn a water wheel, or when heat is fully transferred between two systems so that they are at equilibrium. During the falling of the water, we say that energy is transferred from the movement of the water to the turning of the wheel, and during the exchange of heat, we say that energy was transferred from the hotter to the cooler container.
After reaching ground level, the water can do no more work, and after reaching equilibrium, no more work can be extracted from the thermodynamic system. We say that this energy, we say in this case that there is no more free energy, which is also to say that there is energy that is no longer free to be transferred in such an interaction. Of course, some of the energy implicit in the elevated water could become freed, were we to find a way to get it to flow to an even lower elevation, and some of the energy of a thermodynamic system at equilibrium would again become free if that system were subsequently placed in contact with an even cooler system. Clearly, at some point, there is no place lower for water to flow to, and no cooler system to take on some of the heat of the thermodynamic system. A ladder con the latter condition is called absolute zero, and not surprisingly, matter begins to act strangely near this temperature. This ability to free and trap energy tells us that whatever it is, energy is not in itself the source of change. Rather, as we discussed in chapter 7, it is the availability for movement from place to place or transition from form to form that provides the potential for contrigrade change. This is why constraint on this movement is so central to notions of causality. Moreover, the generation of higher order emergent dynamics also depends on work at a lower order. What we will discover in this chapter is that with each emergent transition, a novel capacity to do work emerges as well, and a new mode of work introduces new causal possibilities into the world. So, to understand the emergence of novel forms of causality, we need to explain the emergence and nature of these higher order forms of work. Effort. Newton's precise analysis of the concept of mechanical work was only the beginning of the physical analysis of this, ex for, of this explanation for change in state. Newton's precise analysis of the concept of mechanical work was only the beginning of the physical analysis of this explanation for change in state. To make all forms of physical work consistent, and to explain their interconvertibility, inter it was necessary for 19th and 20th century scientists to discover how to equate this Newtonian conception with the change-producing capacities of heat engines, chemical reactions, electromagnetic interactions, and nuclear transmutations. By the third decade of the 20th century, this project was largely complete. But behind this towering achievement of theoretical physics is a broader conception of work, one that is generally ignored in the natural sciences because it is assumed to be merely a colloquially analog to this more technical understanding. Indeed, the technical analysis of work was long preceded by this more generic conception that we use to describe a vast array of effortful enterprises. The question that we will address here is whether or not exactly energetic conceptions of work can also be brought into a more precise formal relationship with the physical science notion. In other words, to highlight just one exemplar, can the work of conceiving the, of these thoughts, transforming them into sentences, and selecting the most appropriate words to express them to be understood, to express them be understood as real and measurable as the work of an internal combustion engine, and not merely inquiring about the metabolical support for the neural and muscular biochemical reactions involved, though these are relevant, but the higher order work of forming and interpreting the concepts involved that which makes date but the higher order work of forming and interpreting the concepts involved, that which makes daydreaming effortless but metabolically equivalent. Um, sorry. That which makes daydreaming effortless but metabolically equivalent problem solving difficult. Though often they are not energetically equivalent, I will argue that it is not energy use that makes a difference, but the manipulation of the content of these thoughts, something that we have argued is not physically present. This is not a merely academic problem to be solved. Measuring the amount of work needed for a given task is often an important factor in determining the minimum requirements for success, 
or for determining the relative efficiency of different ways of achieving the same goal. If the assessment of physical tasks, for example, in the assessment of physical tasks, for example, engineers need to routinely calculate how much work must be done to move objects around a factory floor, to lift a heavy object to a certain weight, or to accelerate a vehicle to a given velocity. But the sort of work that we are often interested in analyzing is not always simply physical in this sense. Perhaps the most common uses of the term work refers to activities that do not neatly fit, fit into this physical schema at all, but involve making difficult decisions, analyzing unknown causal effects, and exploring mysteries. We tend to describe our occupations as work. We ask strangers, what kind of work do you do? We talk about driving to work in the morning, where work is either considered a class of human activity or the location of that activity. We consider it work to keep one's home clean, to organize and manipulate food and cooking utensils to prepare a meal, or to convince colleagues of, an un of a counterintuitive theoretical idea. What these more colloquial notions share in common with the Newtonian conception of work is the superficial implication that the activity being described makes things happen that wouldn't come about without it, or else that would happen unless work is done to prevent it. In general terms, then, we can describe all forms of work as activity that is necessary to overcome resistance to change. Resistance can either be passive or active, and so work can be directed towards enacting change that wouldn't otherwise occur, or preventing change that would happen in its absence. This also means that work may be activity pitted against some other form of competing work, as when law enforcement officers work to counter the work of criminals. This more generic use of the concept of work is also employed to describe activities merely requiring mental effort, in which the linkage with physical activity and energetic processes can be quite obscure. We know that producing a novel software routine that is able to accomplish some computational task, or solving a difficult crossword puzzle, or conceiving and organizing the steps necessary to efficiently construct a garment, all take work but it is not at all obvious how to measure or compare these forms of work to each other or to the general physical concept of work. Nevertheless, we are often adept at coming up with relative differences of mental work. Difficult jigsaw puzzles take more work to solve than easy ones. This might be simply because they have more parts, and they can be more difficult if the pieces are all turned upside down so that it, there is no picture to suggest which pieces are likely adjacent to one another a constraint that reduces the amount of work required. To make it even more difficult, some puzzle makers cut the pieces into very nearly the same shape so that constraints of shape incompatibility are made unavailable. These complications do not necessarily require more physical manipulation of the pieces, although this might also follow, but almost certainly they will require more mental manipulation. This simple example indicates that numbers of optional arrangements of things that aren't desirable or functional, and the difficulty of distinguishing among them, contributes to this notion of the amount of mental work required. How might this relate to the more familiar notion of mechanical work? Though some mechanical work is involved in the moving puzzle parts from in moving puzzle parts from place to place and more movements are necessary to discover the correct fittings by trial and error in many component problems than those with fewer components. For the most part, this is not how we intuitively estimate the amount of work that will be required. Probably the best estimator is some measure of the number of operations that will likely be required to reach a solution. Of course, each operation, even each mental operation, requires energy, since these two are not likely to happen spontaneously but this is often the most trivial source of resistance to be overcome. In writing this book, for example, the finger work of typing that, was ne that is necessary to input text into the computer is trivial in comparison to the work required to conceive of and express these ideas. This agrees with the intuition that, re that the reanalysis and reformulation of otherwise widely accepted ways of thinking, particularly the effort to craft a convincing critique and alternative explanation, and that which is involved in discovering how best to communicate ideas that are counterintuitive or alien, or otherwise go against received wisdom, is particularly difficult work, though it may be no more energetically demanding than walking a mile. This suggests that the sources of resistance that are the forces of the work to be done 
also include many tendencies not generally considered by physicists and engineers. For example, tendencies of thought that contribute to the difficulty of changing opinions or beliefs. One might be tempted to object that the family resemblances between these various intentional notions of work and the physicist concept of work are merely superficial, in that the use of the same term to refer to a form of employment or a creative mental effort is only metaphorically related to the Newtonian notion. But if there is a deeper isomorphism linking them all, there could be a great benefit in making sense of this connection. It is becoming increasingly important to discover how best to measure and compare all these diverse forms of work, especially in an era in which vast numbers of people spend their days sorting and analyzing data, organizing information in useful ways, and communicating with one another about how they are doing it. If it were possible to identify some unifying principles that precisely express the interdependencies between the physicist's conception of work and the computer programmer's experience of work, for example, it might have both profound scientific and practical value. This is not just because such knowledge could help to assess the relative efficiency of management strategies, aid Wall Street agencies in, deter in discerning optimal advertising campaigns, or even contribute to political efforts to manipulate public opinion but because work is the common denominator in all attributions of causal power, from billiard ball collisions to military coups to the creative outputs of genius. More generally, what we mean by causality and what we mean by work are deeply interrelated. One of the main reasons scientists and philosophers still argue about the kind of causality that constitutes our ability to initiate goal-directed activities is that we can't figure out how to link this mental form of work to the physical forms of work that are also necessarily involved. To finally cut through the tangle of confusions that surround the mysteries of mental agency and the efficacy of representations then, we first need to develop a general theory of work, one that explicitly demonstrates the link between the ways that both energy and ideas can introduce non-spontaneous change in the world. The anthropologist and systems thinker Gregory Bateson is well known for his relentless effort to expose the widespread fallacy of describing informational relationships in biology and in the human sciences using energetic metaphors. In an effort to define information in its, more gen in its most general sense and to distinguish it from energy, he described it as a difference that makes a difference. This makes explicit a conception of information that is central to Claude Shannon's mathematical theory of communication, and to which Bateson added an implied cybernetic aspect by virtue of the double meaning of making a difference. We will return to the problem of defining information in the next chapters, but this way of talking about difference is somewhat ironically also relevant to the concept of work. Bateson was trying to distill the essence of the logic of information and control theory by highlighting the fact that according to this theory, information was merely a measure of variety, e.g. The, of the letters of, or <coughs> e.g. of letters or signal patterns or difference, and not some thing. He was emphasizing the fact that a difference is an abstract relationship, and as such behaves quite differently from material substances and their interactions. As an example, he points out that a switch is neither within nor outside an electric circuit. It mediates a relationship between events outside and those inside the circuit. When the switch is thrown by an external difference in some feature, for example, a rise in temperature, it creates an internal difference in the circuit, for example, breaking the circuit and cutting the power to the furnace, which in turn causes an external difference, for example, a drop in temperature, and so on. Bateson was reacting against the misleading metaphorical use of energetic concepts to talk about informational processes, such as, such as show up in concepts like the force of ideas, the power of ideology, or the pressure of repressed emotions due to the impeding flow of libido in Freudian theories of neurosis. He was struggling against an entrenched subst substance terminology analogous to the 18th century conceptions of phlogiston and caloric, which obscured the critical differences between physical principles and those beginning to be articulated by the infant fields of information theory and cybernetics. 
This misleading conflation of energy with information often leads us to treat information as though it is a physical commodity, a kind of stuff that one can acquire, store, sell, move, lose, share, and so on. Indeed, as this list makes obvious, this is precisely the colloquial understanding of the concept. Bateson's point suggests that, as in the case of energy, progress could only be made when this was replaced by a dynamic, relational conception of information. This was finally achieved, though incompletely, in the 1940s. In the next chapter, we will reanalyze the concept of information in some detail, and both explain this insight and explore how it still falls short of a full conception of information. But for now, it is sufficient to recognize that this substantial, substantializing tendency is similar to the substance conceptions of energy that dominated the 18th and early 19th centuries. So, although Bateson's phrase captures a number of the important features that characterize information and which show it to be different from mere stuff, much is left ambiguous as well. In fact, it doesn't quite disambiguate energy and information as Bateson had intended. Recently, a colleague, Tyrone Catchman, recounted a discussion he had some years ago with the influential systems ecologist Howard Odom. Cashman was attempting to explain the distinction that Bateson was making between energy and information by the use of his epigrammatic, epigrammatic, what does epigrammatic mean? By his use of the ep, of his epigrammatic phrase, I guess mean, meaning multiple things. Yeah. Bateson, let me look that up. Ooh, internet. Uh, no, no dictionary. Okay, anyway. Ty was trying to explain the distinction that Bateson was making between energy and information by, his, by the use of his epigrammatic phrase, a difference that makes a difference. But Odom objected that his phrase did not, in fact, uniquely demonstrate this distinction because it could equally well be applied to the concept of energetic work a difference in the distribution of energy in one system that can be used to produce a difference in the distribution of energy in another. This objection is well taken. As we saw above, this is a quite accurate abstract definition of the concept of mechanical or thermodynamic work. Was Bateson mistaken, or is this a poor definition of information? On the one hand, I have to agree with Odom that this epigram does not do a very good job of picking out the distinguishing feature of information processes that makes them different from energetic work. On the other hand, it is nevertheless a useful characterization of information, which I think it is. On the other hand, if it is a, nevertheless a useful characterization of information, which I think it is, then this parallelism suggests something quite interesting. It suggests that the generation of information might also be understood as a form of work, perhaps related to, though not merely, energetic work. So, comparison to the development of the energy concept might offer clues about the kinds of misconceptions that tend to arise when analyzing information. This will be the topic of chapters 12 and 13, but before embarking on this issue in greater depth, we can for now explore the implications for a technical conception of work that is as precise but more generalizable than just what we describe with Newtonian physics and thermodynamics. Generalizable even to the processes as diverse, even to processes as diverse as order creation, information production, and decision making. How might the Spatesonian conception, treated as a description of physical work, point the way to a precise general conception of work? Consider how it might apply to a physical process. When energy is transformed from one form to another, it is a difference that is being transferred from substrate to substrate, a gradient of non-equivalence, an asymmetry of distribution, say, of molecular momenta, but there is inevitably some resistance involved in this transfer. Systems resist being shifted away from a state of equilibrium, though, as will become clear in a moment, this resistance is not a simple concept. This is also implicitly captured in Bateson's phrase, since it implies that the second difference is compelled, or made, to come into existence by the first difference. The difference that is made depends on a difference that is provided as given. The implication is that the new difference that is created in this process would not have occurred had the first difference not existed. 
So another way to describe work using the Spatesonian characterization is that it involves something that doesn't tend to happen spontaneously, being induced to happen by something else that is happening spontaneously. In the dynamical terms we introduced in chapter 7, we can describe work as the organization of differences between orthograde processes such that the locus of contragrade process is created such that a locus of contragrade process is created, or more simply, work is a spontaneous change inducing a non-spontaneous change to occur. With this first approximated generic definition, we can now begin to unpack the logic that links energy, form, and information. Isaac Newton had already provided a precise definition of mechanical work prior to the 19th century. The importance of Joule's experiment a few centuries later was to show that there was a precise relationship between this accepted notion of mechanical work and the generation of heat. In both cases, work was being defined with respect to a change of something that would otherwise tend to stay the same, but the relationship between mechanical and thermodynamic work is deeper and more thoroughly interrelated than merely parallel. Recall the fact that thermodynamic properties are macroscopic reflections of Newtonian dynamics at the molecular level. From a Newtonian perspective, each collision of molecules in an ideal gas involves a minute amount of mechanical work, as the colliding molecules are each altered from their prior paths. Even at equilibrium, there is constant molecular collision, and thus constant work occurring at the molecular level. Indeed, the overall energy of the average collision does not differ, whether the system is at equilibrium or far from it. This incessant Brownian motion is the means by which, even at thermal equilibrium, the molecules in a drop of ink dripped into water are eventually diffused through the solution. Without this molecular work, there can be no change in state of any kind. But notice that while it is possible to get work from a system that is in a state far from equilibrium, as it spontaneously develops towards equilibrium, this capacity rapidly diminishes, even if the total amount of molecular level work remains constant throughout. And at equilibrium, the vast numbers of collisions and the vast amount of microscopic work that is still occurring produce no net capacity for macroscopic work. So, although the potential for macroscopic work depends on in an incessant process of microscopic work, macroscopic work doesn't derive from it. Rather, macroscopic work depends on microscopic work being distributed in a very asymmetric way throughout the system. This shows us that the two levels of work, microscopic molecular and macroscopic thermodynamic, are not directly correlated. Microscopic work is a necessary but not sufficient condition for macroscopic work. Any interaction with this system that shifts it from equilibrium will also be the result of changes in these microcollisions, speeding up a subset of molecules that are in contact with a heat source or slowing down some molecules in contact with a cold surface both produce the capacity for thermodynamic work. Irrespective of adding or removing energy from the system, it is the degree of spatially asymmetric difference in average molecular velocities that matters. Ultimately, the capacity of the perturbed system as a whole to be tapped to perform work at the level above that of a molecular collision is a consequence of the distributional features of the incessant micro work, not the energy in the component collisions, which as a whole can increase, decrease, or remain unchanged. In other words, in thermodynamics, the macro doesn't simply reduce to the micro, even though it depends upon it. The macroscopic form of the distribution is the critical factor. So also, like a mass in rectilinear motion, a state of incessant change can also be a stable state in thermodynamics. This suggests another interesting analogy between Newton's notion of work and the thermodynamic conception of work. In Newtonian terms, a mass can only be perturbed from rest or from a linear trajectory by the impositions of extrinsic force, such as by interaction with another mass with different values of velocity and direction, or under the influence of some field of force like gravity. In other words, its resistance to change is reflected in the amount of work required to produce a given change. Resistance is also characteristic of thermodynamic systems. 
A thermodynamic system at equilibrium can only be driven away from its dynamically asymmetric basin by being coupled to a second system with a different value of some system variable, such as temperature or pressure. When two systems with different equilibrium values are coupled, stability gives way to change as the coupled system changes towards a new equilibrium point. The transient phase, during which the now combined larger thermodynamic system changes to a new global equilibrium state, is thus analogous to the brief period during which colliding objects in a Newtonian world are being accelerated or decelerated due to their interaction. In the real world, even Newtonian interactions are not instantaneous, especially if the colliding objects are elastic. Elastic effects underscore the thermodynamic-like basis of even Newtonian interactions, since the elastic rebound of a real colliding solid objects involves an internal asymmetric destabilization in the form of compression of some molecular distances, followed by re-equilibration as both objects' internal energies redistribute. Of course, the analogy becomes increasingly stretched, not to make a pun, at this point, because unlike the Newtonian analog, in which the object's internal states return to where they were before collision, and the objects permanently decouple, interacting thermodynamic systems do not have such a neat distinction between internal state and external relational features, such as momentum. Whatever the source of resistance and stability, however, the change towards the new equilibrium values and the new dynamical stability is spontaneous. This means that the intrinsic pattern of spontaneous change is itself also the source of a system's resistance to change. Thus, two thermodynamic systems which are either at different equilibria or are both undergoing spontaneous change at different rates can be considered contrigade to one another. Because of this, they will do work on one another if they become coupled. This allows us to propose an even more general definition of work. It is simply the production of contrigade change. This way of describing work with respect to a spontaneous tendency of change shows us that the possibility of doing work to change the state of things is itself dependent on the relationships between processes that do not require work. In other words, differences in spontaneous processes of change and the resistance of these to deviation from the specific parameters of that change are the source of work. Or to put it succinctly, contragrade processes arise from the interaction of non-identical orthograde processes. So, somewhat paradoxically, interactions between systems, different spontaneous tendencies are responsible for all non-spontaneous changes. Given that composite systems with inherently iterative dynamics display statistical asymmetries due to variations in their component interactions, a given composite system will generally have quite different asymmetric spontaneous tendencies than a second system. This is particularly likely in cases where the substrates of this interaction are of radically different form, e.g. interactions between light radiation and thermomotion. In previous chapters, we borrowed the distinction between efficient and formal causes from Aristotle to argue that the capacity to produce non-spontaneous change could be loosely analogized to Aristotle's efficient cause and the conditions that produce spontaneous change could loosely be analogized to his formal cause. We now are in a position to be more explicit about this comparison. First, let's recap what we have concluded about orthograde processes. If the global distribution of lower order microwork is not symmetric in a thermodynamic system, then it will tend to change in an asymmetric direction to symmetrize this distribution, and will resist any tendency to reestablish a new asymmetry. It is this distributional feature and the statistical asymmetry of interaction possibilities at the micro level, irrespective of the total work occurring at that lower level, that is responsible for the directionality of change. This property of the whole is effectively a geometric property, both of the spatial distribution and of the statistical distribution of work at a lower level. This distributional basis is why it makes sense to think of this property as a kind of formal cause. But formal constraints and biases do no work. They do not bring about change away from what would occur spontaneously. Yet, as the foundation of any asymmetries that might arise between systems, they become the basis for work at a higher level.
Now consider the capacity for work at these two levels. The non-correlation of relative molecular movements is the basis for the work done by molecular collisions within a gas, but it is the global and statistical distributional character of this lower level work that is responsible for higher level orthograde properties. Analogously, the non-correlation, i.e. non-equivalent values, of the orthodynamic properties of linked thermodynamic systems, e.g. creating a temperature gradient, is responsible for higher level work. So, without microwork, there can be no orthograde tendency to change or resist change at a higher level and no capacity for work at a yet higher level. In this regard, orthograde and contragrade processes provide the necessary conditions each for the other, but at adjacent levels in a compositional hierarchy. If we think of work as the analog of Aristotle's efficient causality, then we can treat efficient and formal cause as interdependent and inseparable counterparts to one another. But there is another interesting distinction that must be added, related to how they inversely react to the symmetry relationships that are their basis, their symmetry with respect to time. Both Newtonian interactions and the transformations produced by thermodynamic work can be run in reverse with approximate symmetry. For example, the movie of a simple billiard ball collision run in reverse does not appear odd, and a heat engine can be run in reverse to produce refrigeration. Yet, a billiard ball break that scatters the balls previously racked into a triangle, and the diffusion of a drop of ink into a glass of water would appear quite unnatural if shown in reverse. We can describe this in abstract terms as follows. When one asymmetry is transformed into another asymmetry, they are symmetric to each other, they are symmetric to one another in their respective deviations from symmetry, which is to say that they are interconvertible. But an asymmetric tra state transformed into a more symmetric state involves a fundamental change in symmetry, so the two states are not interconvertible. But because the production of reversible contragrade change work is always based on lower order irreversible orthograde processes, the reversibility of work is never completely efficient. There must always be some loss in the capacity to, to do work with each transformation. To put this in the form of a mnemonic pun, efficient cause is never 100% efficient. In summary, then, we have identified what appears to be a quite general principle of causality that shows how work and the constraints that make it possible are to be understood in terms of levels of scale and supervenient organization. More generally, this dissects the logic of physical causality into two component aspects, roughly compared to Aristotle's notions of efficient and formal causality. It also distinguishes their complementary roles in the production and organization of change and shows how they complement one another at adjacent levels in a supervenient hierarchy. Transformation. Normally, for human purposes, and for living organisms in general, we focus on only one direction of this interactive effect. That is, we are typically interested in changing the spontaneous status of some one thing in particular to make it more useful, and so endeavor, endeavor to bring some other influence to bear to accomplish this. The, the change this reciprocally imposes on the other system's spontaneous tendency is often not of any consequence to us and tends to be ignored. So, for example, in the familiar case of a simple internal combustion engine used to raise a weight off the ground, see figure 1.1, we take advantage of the spontaneous expansion of the ignited fuel to overcome the spontaneous inertia of the vehicle or the weight, though in the process the rate of expansion of the gas is considerably impeded compared to what would have occurred in the absence of this coupling. The raising of the weight, the slowing of the expansion of the gas, and the constraint that limits where it is able to expand are all different than they would have been in the absence of this coupling. But the expansion of the gas, though slowed by the contragrade action, still proceeds in an orthograde direction, while the change in the position of the weight proceeds in an entirely contragrade direction due to the imbalance of the forces involved. For this reason, we typically describe work being performed on the weight by the exploding gas and not the other way around, even though the slowing of the rate of this expansion is also contrograde and constitutes an equal and opposite amount of work. 
So here we have a diagram. Let's see, figure 1.1. The left diagram schematically depicts the logic of thermodynamic work in which one physical system, A, which is changing in an orthograde direction in which the reduction of free energy and the increase of entropy are depicted as an arrow from higher potential to lower potential, is coupled to another system, B, via constraints that cause the second system to change in the contrograde direction, depicted as the reversal of A. So let's see. A, you have this expanding gas. There's a constraint C that couples system A to system B. So the expanding gas on A can do work on B to decrease the entropy of B, even as the entropy of A increases. Right, and so now we have the same system in an engine. So the expansion of a gas increases the entropy of the gas in A. That pushes a piston which pulls up a weight, right? So the pulling of the weight, the movement of the weight up is non-spontaneous. The expansion of the piston is spontaneous. And so we're using the spontaneous expansion of the piston to do non-spontaneous work on the weight. A familiar example of this relationship is depicted on the right, where an exploding air-fuel mixture in a cylinder is constrained to expand only in one direction, and this is coupled to a simple mechanical device that raises a weight. All right, so this is how cars work, right? You have this, and this is just a wheel, right? <laughs> the wheel of the car to move the weight instead of pulling a weight upward, but it's the same deal. Okay. Within the mechanical and thermodynamic realms, of course, there are many diverse forms of work as there are heat engines. There are as many diverse forms of work as there are heat engines. And this variety is only a fraction of the possibilities, which are as diverse as the possible kinds of substrates and couplings that can be realized. Ultimately, every transformation of energy from one form to another involves work as we have defined it so far. In the transformation, organization matters. How the interactions are constrained is a critical determinant of the nature of the work that results, because ultimately all such transformations involve a change in the dimensions and degrees of freedom, i.e. mode of dynamics and constraints, while the total energy remains unchanged. This inevitably requires work, because it is a process of restructuring constraints. Over the past few centuries, we have learned to build all variety of devices that can convert energy from one form to another. Thus, a temperature gradient can be transformed to generate mechanical work in a heat engine. An electric current can be transformed to generate a temperature gradient in a refrigerator. Light energy can be transformed into electric current in a photovoltaic cell. And all of these processes can be organized to run in the other direction as well. All involve the production of contrograde changes by coupling these otherwise largely uncoupled domains. In the case of a heat engine, these domains are separated by the radical differences in scale between the microscopic molecular motions on the one hand and large-scale mechanical motions on the other. But the distinctions can be even more qualitatively extreme, and as a result the limitations on possible interactions can be quite restrictive. In order to overcome such natural partitioning, it often takes highly specific materials organized in precise forms. This substrate-based limitation on the possibility of interactions is the basis for the diversity of forms of work that can be generated, given the appropriate mediating dynamical, dynamical linkage. So, for example, a photovoltaic cell requires metals in which electrons and their complementary absences, called holes, are easily displaced by light to mediate the transformation of light energy into the energy of an electric charge gradient, and the immense compression force of the sun's gravitation is required to transform nuclear mass into light and heat via nuclear fusion. The real value of this abstract conception of work, however, is not that it provides another, perhaps intuitively more transparent, way to describe forms of work that are already well understood in contemporary physics, but that it provides an abstract general characterization that can even be applied outside these mechanical realms. What is provided by this approach, and is not at all obvious from the physics alone, is the possibility of extending an analytically precise con concept of work into domains that we would not identify with the physics of energetic processes, 
namely the domains of form generation and semiotic processes. In other words, this abstract characterization can be applied to all three levels of dynamics that we have been exploring in this book. On this basis, we can begin to frame a theory of morphodynamic work and teleodynamic work. Such formulations are possible because at each level of dynamics there are classes of orthograde tendencies, conditions of broken symmetry that tend towards greater symmetry, which correspondingly define classes of attractor states analogous to thermodynamic equilibrium. Thus, the coupling of morphodynamic systems or teleodynamic systems can analogously bring their distinct and often complex orthograde tendencies into interaction, causing contragrade tendencies to emerge from their net differences. This opens the door to an emergent capacity to generate ever more complex, unprecedented forms of work at progressively higher order levels of dynamics, thereby introducing an essentially open-ended possibility of producing causal consequences that wouldn't tend to arise spontaneously. That is, we can begin to discern a basis for a form of causal openness in the universe. To frame these insights in somewhat more enigmatic and cosmic terms, we might speculate that whereas the conservation laws of science tell us that the universe is closed to the creation and destruction of the amount of possible difference, the ultimate de determinant of what constitutes mass energy available in the world, they do not restrict the distributional possibilities that these differences can assume, and it is distributional relationships which determine the forms that change can take. Having said this, we want to keep in mind that the relationship between these different dynamical paradigms of work is complex. In one sense, they are but anal analogs of one another, and it is important that they not be confused. They involve very different substrates and conceptions of what is spontaneous or not, very different conceptions of what constitutes the differences that generate spontaneous change, and even quite distinct notions of what constitutes a locus or system and how they may be linked together. And yet, and yet they are also more than mere analogs of one another. They play the same functional role They play the same functional role at each of at each of dynamical they play the same functional role at each dynamical level, and more important, they are hierarchically interdependent and nested in the same way as are these three levels of dynamics. Teleodynamic work is dependent on morphodynamic work is dependent on thermodynamic work. At each level, there is a class of orthograde and contragrade tendencies in which contragrade change can only be affected by pitting orthograde processes against each other. The change of a thermodynamic system towards a state of increased entropy, if totally unperturbed by, unperturbed by extrinsic influences, is the classic and most basic example of orthograde change. In the real world, of course, nothing is ever completely isolated, and no physical system remains forever unperturbed by external influences, though it is often argued that this is true of the whole universe, even if it is finite. This means that thermodynamic orthograde change is often resisted, modulated, or reversed, depending on the relative degree and duration of interaction with other contrary constraints or processes. In any context, orthograde processes will continue until they reach a state in which there is symmetry in the probable directions of change, or until the supportive conditions change. This dynamical terminus of an orthograde process is its attractor, which may or may not be a quiescent state. In chapter 8, we extended the concept of orthograde dynamics to include intrinsically asymmetric forms of dynamics that arise in persistently far from equilibrium contexts. Such morphodynamic change is comparable in form to the orthograde asymmetry described by the second law in three important respects. One, it exhibits a highly probable characteristic intrinsically generated asymmetric bias in the way, in the way that global properties change. Two, the direction of this change converges towards a common attractor irrespective of initial conditions. And three, this asymmetry is dynamically supervenient on a balanced, i.e. symmetric, lower order contragrade dynamic work. Recall that thermodynamic orthograde processes depend on incessant lower order molecular interactions whose contragrade effects work are time symmetric and in an isolated system, the total energy of the system, e.g. measured at its specific heat, remains constant throughout the orthograde change, and is in this sense balanced, though entropy increases. This incessant lower-order contragrade activity guarantees constant change from state to state, 
but the asymmetric directionality of the trajectory of global change is not a direct consequence of this work. The constant lower order contrograde activity determines constant change, but not its directionality. This global asymmetry has a formal origin because it develops within the bias geometry of the space of possible trajectories of change. Figure 11.2, countercurrent exchange, demonstrates how formal constraints can be harnessed to do thermodynamic work. By causing media like coolant liquids in a heat exchanger or blood and environmental water in fish gills to flow in opposed directions, the asymmetries created can locally drive the system far beyond passive thermodynamic equilibrium, e.g. passive diffusion or parallel flow above, so long as the movement continues. Though most naturally occurring countercurrent processes involve fluids and heat transfer or chemical diffusion, as in fish gills and kidneys, this is a generalizable relationship. It can apply to any process involving entropy increase slash decrease, including information processes. So in countercurrent in flow, we can contrast countercurrent to diffusion, right? So in this case, in parallel flow, you have two veins that are flowing in the same direction and they start one vein is at a hundred percent concentration the other vein is at zero percent concentration and as they flow you go over here and now they're at 50 50 right so this is fairly similar to this thing we have above where you have two cells one at zero one at a hundred and by passive diffusion they reach 50 50 it's basically the same thing only you have flow um, but the flow doesn't do anything to the diffusion gradient at all but if you have countercurrent, then you have something at 100 and something that's near 100. So diffusion is always going to flow from one into the other. And so you can, you can get almost complete transfer of solutes from one vein to the other if they're in a countercurrent direction. Whereas here, when they're in a concurrent direction, you can only get 50% of solute exchange. So that's the logic of countercurrent exchange in this diagram. Now he's going to talk about countercurrent exchange. The, the formatting of the book makes it a little backwards. An interesting example of the relationship between formal constraints and thermodynamic work is provided by the processes that involve countercurrent diffusion, also often described as countercurrent flow. See figure 11.2. That's what we just looked at. This is a common mechanism found in the living world for driving systems beyond the point of thermodynamic equilibrium using oppositely directed fluid flow. It is characteristic of the ways fish gills extract oxygen from water, kidneys extract metabolites from blood, sea turtles cool themselves, and many birds regulate their core body temperature via blood flow in their legs. It is also an important trick used in engineering applications, such as in cooling systems for nuclear reactors and desalination processes. Similarly, morphodynamic orthograde processes are also dynamically supervenient on incessant lower order stable contragrade dynamics. The balance symmetry between incessant intrinsically introduced forms of destabilization, which introduce constraints, and the incessant spontaneous orthograde dissipation of these constraints. This constitutes a dissipative system in Pyrgein's terms. An asymmetric trend towards amplification and propagation of constraints to higher levels of scale can result if these constraints are not dissipated as quickly as they are introduced. This asymmetry is not, however, simply an elaboration of this lower order symmetric dynamic, but rather again reflects global formal biases of available trajectories of global property change. The asymmetry arises under these conditions as constraints compound nonlinearly. This occurs because any dynamical option that is impeded from occurring due to the introduction of extrinsic constraint cannot lead to increased dynamical variation via any further contrograde interactions than the constrained region of the system has with others. Thus, as long as new extrinsic constraint is introduced faster than it is dissipated, e.g. due to incessant disruption as in heating, subsequent changes, stages of change will exhibit progressively reduced ranges of variation. In other words, they will self-simplify and become more orderly. Teleodynamic orthograde processes are more complex because they dynamically supervene on morphodynamic processes. Nevertheless, these general principles still apply with respect to their lower order dynamical support. 
teleodynamic patterns of change emerge from the contrograde interactions between morphodynamic processes. Thus, in the model autogenic system described in the last chapter, two morphodynamic orthograde processes progress, process with entirely different attractor dynamics. Autocatalysis and self-assembly interact, and as a result do work with respect to one another. Importantly, this interaction occurs in both the thermodynamic and morphodynamic domains. Assuming that both processes are thermodynamically orthograde in supportive conditions, each can only be sustained if there is constant work to maintain the thermodynamic imbalance that supports this asymmetry. In the case of each morphodynamic process, both autocatalysis and self-assembly require continuously maintaining locally high levels of substrate molecules. This could, for example, be extrinsically provided in laboratory conditions. But when these processes are linked by virtue of a product of one of the one autocatalysis serving as the substrate for the other self-assembly, such supportive boundary conditions can in part be intrinsically generated. Thus, while autocatalytic substrates need to be available, the process of autocatalysis provides substrates for self-assembly and generates more in this local region even as they are taken up by accretion to the growing shell. Reciprocally, as we saw in the last chapter, self-assembly minimizes diffusion of the interdependent catalysts, which is critical for its continuation. However, it, eventually, it also eventually halts autocatalysis via enclosure. So autocatalysis is doing thermodynamic work by asymmetrically increasing the local concentration of substrates for shell self-assembly, and self-assembly is doing thermodynamic work in impeding the catalyst diffusion. In addition, this interaction involves counterfailing constraint generation processes and thus morphodynamic work. This higher order form of work is described in detail in the, ne in the next section. Each morphodynamic process generates increasing constraints, though in different domains. But the development of constraints on diffusion that result from self-assembly of a shell increasingly limits the substrate availability that is required for autocatalysis to the point that ultimately autocatalysis halts inside a container entirely depleted of substrates. Self-assembly of a closed shell is additionally self-limiting. But the likely enclosure of a complete set of independent catalysts also involves morphodynamic work in creating the constraints to prevent dissolution of these interdependencies and possibly to replicate them. The resulting self-reconstituting capacity is a teleodynamic orthograde dynamic that is persistently potentiated by this underlying morphodynamic and thermodynamic work. Although attempting to outline a general theory of work may sound like a tedious and dull enterprise, it turns out to be critical for, the clarif for clarifying the concepts of form and information. As it, it turns out to be as critical for clarifying the concepts of form and information as it was to, to clarifying the concept of energy in 19th, in 19th century physics. Morphodynamic work. Thermodynamic orthograde processes are vastly more likely to appear spontaneously in the universe than morphodynamic orthograde processes. Correspondingly, examples of spontaneously occurring morphodynamic work are rare in comparison to thermodynamic work, and are also easily missed because of their form is unfamiliar. To help identify them, we can begin by defining our search criteria by considering some thermodynamic analogies and disanalogies. Any change of state is ultimately a thermodynamic change, but some thermodynamic changes are more complex than others. In describing forms of work that are more complex than thermodynamic work, we are not implying the existence of some new source of energy or a form of physical change that is independent of thermodynamic change, and certainly not an ineffable influence. Higher order forms of work inevitably also involve, and indeed require, thermodynamic work as well, it's just that the account of certain processes in thermodynamic terms is too simple, completely ignoring whole categories of phenomena that play critical roles in organizing what is occurring. This is because thermodynamic descriptions only provide an accounting of energies involved and assume as given the boundary conditions and structural constraints with, in which the thermodynamic transformations take place. But thermodynamic work can also change these boundary conditions. And since these are essential determinants of the organization of the causal possibilities in a system, its orthograde and contrograde organization, this higher level of change is often the most critical factor for understanding a system's dynamics.
as we have just seen in our considerations of various machines, the formal regularities and symmetry conditions of these constraints and the correlations between them provide the framework within which thermodynamic work is made possible. Thermodynamics can be considered independently of these enabling constraints because analysis is focused on constant features of energy conservation, energy transformation, and the quantity of work involved. But, as we will see, the way that constraints in one system can influence constraints in the other linked in, in other linked systems follows a logic that exhibits invariant features irrespective of diverse thermodynamic conditions. Because the rate of thermodynamic change is a function of the properties of the phase space of possible microstates, and these are a function of the constraints and biases of dissipation and microinteraction, any alteration of these conditions implicitly involves thermodynamic work. But to the extent that constraints on thermodynamic tendencies are required to perform thermodynamic work, it is also the case that prior constraints are being used to create new constraints whenever thermodynamic work is performed. This capacity of constraints on dynamical change to propagate new constraints to other linked dynamical systems is the capacity for thermodynamic work. This footnote is probably important. Let's see what it has to say. Come on, footnote. Go. It's not bringing me to the footnote. Okay. In the case of thermodynamic work, it was first necessary to describe those processes that tend to happen spontaneously, and then identify the ways that this can be resisted and or used to overcome this resistance in coupled systems. Similarly, in the case of morphodynamic work, we need to begin an analysis of spontaneous tendencies of constraint formation and then explore the ways that these tendencies generate resistance to perturbation and how that can be used to perturb spontaneous constraint formation in coupled systems. The second law of thermodynamics describes what tends to happen spontaneously, orthograde change in the thermodynamic domain. Morphodynamic processes also exhibit powerful tendencies to develop towards stable dynamical patterns. Therefore, juxtaposing or resisting these tendencies can be analogously understood as involving a form of work, contrograde effects with respect to orthograde tendencies. That said, the dependency of morphodynamic processes on thermodynamic processes makes the distinction between them subtle and complicated. Morphodynamic processes are not only dependent on underlying thermodynamic dissipative processes, they are specifically the result of constant thermodynamic work continually countering the entropy increasing tendency within some restricted or partially isolated domain. Whether the whistle of the wind blowing across the wires and tree branches, or the hexagonally symmetric rolling of convection cells transferring heat to the surface air, all morphodynamic regularities arise in the context of a balance between the rate at which the system would spontaneously develop towards higher entropy and the externally imposed thermodynamic work impeding this process, a balance, that is, of thermodynamic orthograde and contrograde influences. In this regard, morphodynamic regularity establishes a new level of dynamical equilibrium between the rate of entropy increase and the rate of work countering this tendency. This is why self-organized regularity of a low order of complexity is a special case, not the rule, in nature. Most often, constantly perturbed systems remain in semi-chaotic turbulent states. The balance of independent parameters that is required for convergence towards dynamic regularity is often quite specific and for this reason an unlikely coincidence. The basic distinction between thermodynamic work and morphodynamic work can be easily recognized because of the specificity of form involved in the latter. For example, a vortex formed in a stream behind a boulder or a sharp bend in a stream bank is a morphodynamic system produced by incessant thermodynamic work. Water molecules that have acquired momentum as they spontaneously flow downhill encounter the resistance of the boulder and the work that results from their interaction systematically shifts the momentum of many molecules angularly with respect to their original trajectories. But this redirect in, redirection is contrograde to the orthograde flow and tends to impede downstream movement, potentially causing local instabilities as water builds up here and there faster than it moves on, creating increased turbulent flow. Vortex formation regularizes the redistribution of this instability, with the result that such chaotic imbalances are minimized. 
the rotational symmetry of the vortex that accomplishes this redistribution of angular momentum in the flow is thus a consequence of one, the resymmetrizing orthograde thermodynamics that causes chaotic flow to be self-undermining, and two, the geometric constraints on how the global asymmetry introduced by the boulder can be globally resymmetrized to again produce more nearly linear flow. What kind of work can be done with respect to this morphodynamic orthograde tendency? Notice that stirring with a paddle in parallel with this rotation will not disrupt it, but stirring in any other pattern or merely impeding this pattern of flow will tend to disrupt it. These disturbing patterns of interaction are in this way contrary to the orthograde tendency of the system to regularize. The non-parallel patterns of interaction are doing morphodynamic work against this orthograde tendency whereas the parallel pattern is not. Notice also that any pattern that results in morphodynamic work also involves thermodynamic work, whereas the parallel pattern does not. But this, but this is relative to the orthograde tendency that is intrinsic to the system in question. Thus, if the flow tends to be chaotic because the geometric organization of the stream pattern with respect to the flow rates are not conductive to vortex formation, stirring in the appropriate direction can aid vortex formation and decrease turbulence. This would also be morphodynamic work, since vortex formation was not the intrinsic orthograde tendency. Consequently, the introduction of morphodynamic work also requires thermodynamic work, and notice that the amount of mechanical thermodynamic work involved is strongly dependent on the form of the paddle-induced disturbance with, reflect, with respect to the form of the flow. This suggests a general rule. In order to perturb a dissipative, self-organized dynamical form away from its spontaneous attractor tendency, a conflicting form must be introduced, and the combined amount of thermodynamic and morphodynamic work involved will be a function of the number of dimensions of asymmetry that are reversed in the process, adjusted according to their relative magnitudes in the two alternative dynamical processes. In this way, the parameters defining the higher level morphodynamic work play a significant role in determining the correlated amount of thermodynamic work that is required. Recognizing that there are both parallels and asymmetric dependency relationships involved, we need to be clear about the analogies and disanalogies between morphodynamic and thermodynamic work. For example, we might be tempted to describe the regular dynamics of simple self-organized processes as morphodynamic equilibria on the analogy of thermodynamic equilibria. Such an, analogy, such an analogy is complicated by the fact that many morphodynamic processes remain partially chaotic, like the stream example above, describable only in terms of constraints, not geometric regularities, and even simple morphodynamic systems may have more than one quasi-stable dynamical attractor. This complicated attractor logic, which has become the hallmark of complexity studies, also complicates the analysis of morphodynamic work. Because the potential for explosive symmetry breaking in morphodynamic systems, describing the way that the interaction between morphodynamic processes can transform their orthograde dynamics into contragrade change in the morphodynamic domain, i.e. the description of a morphodynamic engine, if you will, is far more difficult than for the thermodynamic systems. This is in part due to the hierarchic complexity of morphodynamic processes. It takes thermodynamic work to drive morphodynamic attractors, so morphodynamic interactions cannot undermine this thermodynamic base and still do morphodynamic work. Precisely organizing a mediating mechanism that is able to take advantage of the interactions between different morphodynamic orthograde attractors is thus limited by the need to align both thermodynamic and morphodynamic processes. Moreover, since morphodynamic attractors are not merely defined by quantitative parameters, e.g. energy gradients, but also by formal symmetry properties, the possibilities for contragrade alignment of different morphodynamic processes are very much more restricted. So here we have an example of morphodynamic work. The, ta the figure blurb reads, <laughs> A diagrammatic depiction of the thermodynamic work performed by an organism to maintain its integrity with respect to thermodynamic degradation and to support its higher order orthograde teleodynamic capacity to replicate the constraints that support this process. Organisms must extract resources from their environment, e.g. by doing work A to constrain some energy gradient in order to access free energy to maintain their metabolisms, which maintain a persistently far from equilibrium state. So, A, 
here is an organism capturing energy. Because the environment is often variable, they must also obtain information, I, about this variability in order to use it as a source of constraints, C, to regulate the work they perform. So, just keep reading. I'm a little lost. must obtain information I about this variability in order to use it as a source of constraints to regulate the work they perform. Constraints are depicted as right triangles deviating energy flows arrows, and the constraints inherited genetically G are depicted as both within and outside the organism, since they are inherited from a parent organism. So what do we have going on here? So here's an, here's an energy source going from high concentration to low concentration. So what is A? Uh, organism doing work A. So the organism does work A, and so some of this flow, instead of going dissipating here, is channeled into the organism's metabolism. And the organism's metabolism is constrained, C, to regulate work about this variability in order to use it as a source of constraint to regulate the work they perform. So the organism metabolism is constrained to channel the work that the organism does to, to creating constraints to channel more energy back into the organism. And that energy also goes into rebuilding the constraints of the organism, which is in turn constrained by the information in the genome information of the environment and information of the genome. All right, uh, I'll go through that one more time to make it clear. So here you have an energy source. Let's say this is a plant, right? So this is the sun and the sun is radiating energy onto the earth, but instead of being dissipated as heat, some of it is captured by the constraints of the leaves of the plant, right? They've got chloroplasts which constrain the lights and send it through all the photosystems, blah, 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 blah. So the energy from the sun is captured and it goes into the organism's metabolism. And as the organism metabolizes this energy, the energy continues down its energy gradient eventually to be pushed into waste heat. But some of that energy is used to, one, rebuild the constraints of the organism, the metabolic constraints of the organism. And the metabolic constraints of the organism channel some of that energy to capturing more light, right? Building more leaves building the organism is constrained by G, the genome, and I, information from the environment. Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. Despite these conceptual difficulties, we have already described one special case of morphodynamic work, a simple molecular autogenic system. It is a special case because of its precise recursive synergistic organization. But before reconsidering this special case in terms of the work involved, we need to examine some more generic examples in order to gain a general conception of what gets transformed during morphodynamic work. Consider, for example, a resonating chamber such as a flute or a penny whistle that is continually supplied with energy by air passed across an aperture. With this steady turbulent flow at one end, the air along the length of the resonating tube settles into a stable vibratory pattern heard as a continuous tone. Changes in the effective length of the chamber produced by opening or closing holes at various positions along the length change which pattern of vibration tones are stable, even if the flow of blown air remains the same. Resonant vibrations are remarkably robust in linear chambers like the tube of a flute, but in irregular shaped chambers they become less reliable and more sensitive to changes in the energy supplied. Even in a musical instrument like a flute, fluctuation of input energy can disrupt convergence in sta to a stable vibration. A common experience for a nov novice flautist is to blow too hard, too soft, or at the wrong angle across the mouthpiece, with the result that the sound warbles between alternate tones interspersed with hissing sound of chaotic airflow. This demonstrates that the morphodynamic regularity exhibited by the tone being produced is sensitive to the rate and form of the perturbing energy being introduced. Once stable vibration is established, however, the sound of the flute can induce other objects, e.g. a wine glass, to vibrate sympathetically to the extent that they too are capable of regular vibration in the frequency range of the flute tone. <laughs> 
Interestingly, if this sympathetic resonator has its own distinct re distinctive resonant frequency, as an, unsta an unstable reaction may result, with the consequence that it vibrates in a pattern that is different from the typically different from but typically attracted to some regular multiple of the frequency of the flute tone, a harmonic. Not only constant energy, but constantly dissonant vibrations must be provided to induce the glass to assume a vibration pattern that is different from it, its most robust spontaneous resonant frequency. Thus there are two levels of work that are necessary to maintain this non-spontaneous regularity. One, thermodynamic work, which is responsible for the energy necessary to induce the sympathetic resonator to vibrate. And two, morphodynamic work, which is necessary to cause the sympathetic resonator to vibrate at something other than its spontaneous frequency. The role of morphodynamic work is demonstrated by the fact that even with the same energy, different driving frequencies will have very different capacities to push the resonant response away from its spontaneous frequency. In other words, the differential in regularity between vibratory patterns of two resonating objects results in a pattern in one that would not occur if the specific pattern of excitation were different or random. Moreover, if these two differently resonating objects are rigidly connected, connected the effect can be bidirectional. The total system will likely assume, assume a vibrational state that is a complex superposition of the two resonant patterns in proportion to other relative properties such as shape, relative mass, and vibrational rigidity, as well as each structure becomes a source of morphodynamic work affecting the other. Let's be more specific about this subtle distinction between the two levels of work in this example. Separately, each of the resonating structures tends to converge to a different, relatively stable global vibrational state when mechanical energy is introduced and allowed to dissipate. Resonance is a morphodynamic attractor the resultant stable form of an orthograde tendency. It is produced because of the geometry of the resonating chamber, the vibration propagating characteristics of the material, and the level and stability of the input energy. These are the boundary conditions responsible for the morphodynamic attractor tendency. For differently resonant bodies, the boundary conditions are different and will determine different orthograde tendencies. The thermodynamic work, blowing, that induces vibration is potentially able to produce an unlimited number of vibratory patterns. What actually gets produced is dependent on the specific boundary conditions imposed by the flute. Although no vibration will occur without the introduction of a stable airflow to contribute the energy of the vibration, constant thermodynamic work, the properties of the flute will constrain the domain of the possible spontaneous orthograde stable vibrational patterns. And this will be robust to modest changes in the flow of air, so that the range of input energies will converge to a simple resonant frequency. This many-to-one mapping of thermodynamic work to morphodynamic work is a characteristic feature of this dependency relationship, but it is not simply a many-to-one relationship. It is the mapping of a continuum to discrete states. We will return to this feature later because it turns out to be a critical contributor to the discontinuity of emergent effects as we move up the hierarchy from thermodynamic to morphodynamic to teleodynamic processes. The morphodynamic work produced by linking oscillators results from one set of boundary conditions affecting the other. another. Specifically, their differences in geometry, mass, and the way they conduct vibratory energy all contribute to the total work of this transfer form. The thermodynamic work component is roughly the same irrespective of whether the coupled oscillators reinforce each other's vibrations or rapidly damp all regular vibrations, transferring most of the energy into irregular micro vibrations of heat. To the extent that their resonant features interact to produce a shift of global regularities compared to the uncoupled condition, morphodynamic work is also involved and can be judged more or less efficient on the basis of this transfer of global regular global dynamics. But whereas thermodynamic coupling yields a combined system that de-differentiates towards a state of global equilibrium determined by a mean boundary condition of the total, morphodynamic coupling does not. There is nothing quite analogous to a mean value because of the relative discreteness of the morphodynamic attractors involved. The coupling of boundary conditions must be such that each reinforces the other in some respect in producing a third discrete orthograde tendency one that is both amplified one that is both amplified and amplifies each of the other two for two oscillators this can be a simple common multiple of the two resonant frequencies 
but with additional couplings, the probability of simple and discrete dynamics quickly diminishes, and dynamical chaos results. And beyond the domain of simple oscillators, this is far more likely to be the case. This means that the ability to perform morphodynamic work can be easily disrupted. In coupled physical resonators, for example, if one structure is more regular in shape and form, and therefore more effective at form ampl amplification, it will tend to drive the vibratory activity of the coupled system, though this will be resisted and constrained by the vibratory regularities or irregularities of the second structure to which it is linked. In this case, we can say that morphodynamic work is continually bringing the less resonant system to a non-spontaneous, semi-regular vibratory state. In the case where both have different but nearly, equal, but nearly equally efficient resonant tendencies, the resulting vibratory state of the coupled system may converge to a pattern that combines the two, amplifying common harmonics and producing complex waveforms, or may never resolve a chaotic state because of the incompatibility of their orthograde tendencies. In such cases of competing resonant tendencies, we can discern another parallel to, with thermodynamic work. Some systems are more difficult to perturb than others. In other words, the orthodynamic tendencies of different systems may be of different strengths. Just as objects with greater momentum or inertia and thermodynamic systems with greater total specific energy require more mechanical work to produce equal changes of motion compared to less massive or extensive systems, morphodynamic systems can differ greatly in the relative strength of their attractor dynamics. There are two potential contributors to this morphodynamic inertia. First, one system may simply be more susceptible to thermodynamic work because it is physically smaller, less massive, or better at conducting energy. This follows from the simple fact that morphodynamic work is entirely dependent on thermodynamic work. But second, one system may be more regular, such as the shaped body of a resonant musical instrument, where it may be more easily regularized, as in the minimally constrained flow of fluid in a Bernard cell or a vortex. This combination of factors will determine both the potential to do morphodynamic work and the tendency to resist morphodynamic change. The potential to perform either thermodynamic or morphodynamic work is proportional to the divergence from an attractor maximum. But this can be a problem for the capacity to do morphodynamic work, because systems with complex attractors tend not to exhibit consistent, extended, spontaneous change in any single direction. This means that only systems with highly reliable and relatively simple attractor dynamics are able to contribute any significant amount of morphodynamic work. This makes it difficult to find spontaneous this makes it difficult to find spontaneous examples of morphodynamic work and makes it very rare for highly complex morphodynamic transformations to occur without highly sophisticated forms of human intervention. So, although simple examples such as the coupled resonators described above represent exceptions in nature, not the rule, simplicity is an advantage when it comes to making use of morphodynamic work. This is not, however, an absolute impediment since elaborate webs of morphodynamic work are found in the metabolic networks of living organisms. What about more complex morphodynamic, pro morphodynamic processes that produce regularities with more dimensions of regularity? Consider the somewhat fanciful Rube, Rube, consider the somewhat fanciful Rube Goldberg uses for Bernard cell formation. The regular hexagonal tessellation of the surface of, of the water could, for example, be utilized to sort small floating objects into discrete collections of, small, of similar numbers, each collection sitting within a tiny hexagonal bowl of a Bernard cell. Or the concave shape of these regular surface depressions could be used to focus incident light to dozens of individual points just above the surface. In these cases, there is very little thermodynamic work linking the two interacting substrates, especially in the case of reflected light, but the morphodynamic work occurs as the spontaneous regularization of the fluid convection similarly regularizes something else that would otherwise never assume this configuration. Thus, via morphodynamic work, two otherwise independent thermodynamic systems accomplish thermodynamic, accomplishing thermodynamic work can be coupled. More practical examples of morphodynamic work include the use of specially shaped vessels or vibrating containers for sorting different shapes, weights, or sizes of particular materials such as pills or grains. Depending on the shape of the vessel, 
the way it is rotated or shaken to induce the contained objects to move with respect to one another, and the difference in object features, such as shape or weight, it is possible to automatically separate objects, transforming a well-mixed, uniformly distributed collection into a highly asymmetric distribution in which different types of objects occupy different positions relative to one another. Natural examples of this particle sorting process occur with pebbles on ocean beaches and stones rising to the surface in soil as a result of periodic freezes and thaws, but other uses include ways of separating pills and minerals, as well as the classical method of separating gold nuggets from sand and other pebbles by panning. Morphodynamic work shares one very significant attribute with thermodynamic work, the law of diminishing returns. As a consequence of the first and second laws of thermodynamic and the constraints of doing work, perpetual motion machines are impossible. There are always some degrees of freedom of increasing entropy that cannot be fully constrained, and so the capacity to do work in one direction and then reverse this organization and use that gradient to do work in the opposite direction decreases with each step, making full reversal unobtainable. The potential to do iterated morphodynamic work also dimin diminishes rapidly with increasing degrees of freedom, and thus also with each interaction. There is something analogous to nature's prohibition of perpetual motion machines when it comes to morphodynamic work as well. In fact, the efficiency problem is much worse because of the discreteness issue. In most instances of coupled morphodynamic processes, the interactions between their distinct regularities result in complex dynamics that appear highly chaotic. Classical examples of so-called determinist chaos reflect the complexity that can result even as a result of coupling three otherwise quite simple morphodynamic processes into a larger system, as for example happens when different length pendulums are coupled with one another. Whereas the recursive dynamics in simple self-organizing system amplify regular dynamic features, strongly coupled self-organizing processes can recursively amplify both concordant and non-concordant boundary conditions, producing complex and often extreme divergence and damping effects. This is especially true if thermodynamic energy is continually introduced, as in dissipative systems. This kind of coupling of organized dynamical processes is probably one of the factors contributing to the unpredictable and almost turbulent character of human social economic systems, social and economic systems. Though we will see, this tendency to complexity becomes amplified to a far greater extent, to a far greater extent when we consider the superposition, superimposition of teleodynamic processes. Given these limitations, and since morphodynamic irregularities, even with robust simple attractors, only form under very limited boundary conditions, interactions between morphodynamic systems with different boundary conditions end up producing larger systems with complicated and irregular boundary conditions. So, for many reasons, morphodynamic work of any significant complexity and magnitude will tend to occur quite rarely under natural circumstances. Next part, teleodynamic work. There is, however, one class of phenomena that presents glaring exceptions to this rarity, living processes. Indeed, self-organizing processes in living organisms and ecosystems defy the apparent problem of the chaos that should tend to result from coupling self-organizing processes to one another, and to an astounding degree, since even the simplest bacteria are composed of hundreds of strongly coupled cycles of chemical processes. Life appears to have cornered the market on morphodynamic work, and to have done so by taming the almost inevitable chaos that comes with morphodynamic interactions. Not only are living organisms themselves enormously complex webs of self-organizing processes, but they also tend to evolve to complement higher order complex dynamical regularities made up of large numbers of other organisms comprising their ecosystem, all embedded in semi-regular patterns of climate and resource change. So it is within living processes that we must turn to find the greatest number and diversity of exemplars of morphodynamic work. Besides energy and raw materials to maintain their far from equilibrium thermodynamics, living organisms also require incessant form production processes, production of specific molecular forms, specific patterns of chemical reactions, and specific structural elements. Morphodynamic work must be reliable and constant for life to be possible. This requires both thermodynamic and morphodynamic work cycles, engines of form production that are analogous to human engines designed to perform thermodynamic work cycles. The process of biological evolution, 
has not merely discovered and remembered how to set up vast array of morphodynamic work processes. It has discovered complex synergies and reciprocities between them that enable repeatable cycling. We have encountered a simple example of this in the case of autogens, but to understand how the evolutionary process is able to mine the morphodynamic domain for these sorts of reciprocities and complementarities, we will first need to understand a yet higher order form of work, teleodynamic work. Teleodynamic work can be defined analogously to the prior levels of work we have described. It is the production of contragrade teleodynamic processes. Since this must be understood in terms of orthograde teleodynamic processes, the first step in describing this level of work is to define and identify examples of orthograde teleodynamics. In general terms, an orthograde teleodynamic process is an n-directed process, and more specifically, it is one that will tend to occur spontaneously. Although teleodynamic processes are incredibly complex, and an explanation of the structure of teleodynamic work is by far the most elaborate, since it is constituted by special relationships between forms of morphodynamic work, it is also the most familiar. So it may be helpful to first consider the human side of teleodynamic work before delving into the underlying dynamical structure of this process. Teleodynamic work is what we must engage in when trying to make sense of an unclear explanation, or trying to produce an explanation that is unambiguous. It is what must be produced to solve a puzzle, to persuade resistant listeners, or to conduct scientific investigations. It is also the sort of work that goes on in board meetings and in domestic arguments, and which leads to the design of machines and governments. It is char and it characterizes what is difficult about creative thought processes. Although these examples could mostly be considered forms of mental work, they have a natural kinship with the simple process of communicating, and with biological adaptive processes as well. All share in common the work of generating new information and new functional relationships, or of changing thought patterns or habits of communication and human intentional actions. If you have read to this point, you have probably found some parts of the text quite difficult to follow. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. <laughs> if you have read to this point, you have probably found some parts of the text quite difficult to follow. Perhaps you have even struggled without success to make sense of some claim or unclear description. But unless you are a very easily agitated reader, you will probably have not found yourself running out of breath, <laughs> running out of breath or breaking a sweat because of the energy you have exerted to do this. While writing this chapter, I took a break to cut and split some wood for a fire. Doing so worked up a sweat. Though only a small fraction of writing time was devoted to this process, I no doubt expended far more energy chopping wood than in all my writing for the day. But which was the more total work? Obviously, the energy expended isn't the most useful means of assessment. Nevertheless, engaging in the effort of writing or reading does require metabolically generated energy and the more difficult the task of creation or interpretation, or the more stimulating or frustrating, the more thermodynamic work tends to be involved. We have no trouble recognizing the capacity to do this kind of work. In an individual, we may describe it as intelligence. In a simpler organism, we may describe it in terms of its adaptability. This is the power that we recognize in great insights, influential ideologies, or highly developed analytical tools. It is the power to change minds and organize human groups. It can ultimately translate into the power to move mountains, as the old adage implies, though its capacity to do this is necessarily quite indirectly implemented. It is commonly described as the power of ideas. So here we have a figure. Teleodynamic work drives cognition contragrade to free association. Reading exemplifies the logic of teleodynamic work. Hey, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm reading to you. A passive source of cognitive constraints is potentially provided by the letter forms on a page. A literate person has structured his or her sensory and cognitive habits to use such letter forms to reorganize the neural activities constituting thinking. This enables us to do teleodynamic work, to shift mental tendencies away from those that are spontaneous, such as daydreaming, to those that are constrained by the text. Artist Giovanni Battista Piazzetta. Reading. So, 
Engaging in teleodynamic work is one of the most familiar mental experiences of being a human agent. It is what characterizes what we describe as intentionally willed action. It is naturally understood as work because of the resistance that it can overcome and because it is required in order to modify otherwise spontaneous mental or communicative processes, such as an otherwise unquestioned belief or habitual process of reasoning. But as familiar as this experience is in everyday life, its relationship to physical work is often quite ambiguous, even though it is intuitively taken for granted. No one would confuse what must be done to raise a weight with what must be done to raise a question, but both involve effort, that experience of promoting contrograde dynamics. And while physicists and engineers can be incredibly precise at comparing the amount of work that is done to accelerate a car versus a baseball to, thir to 60 miles per hour, it seems almost a matter of idiosyncratic opinion how one should compare the work of solving a mathematical equation to that of solving a crossword clue, puzzle clue. So we might be forgiven for thinking that the latter cases of mental work are merely metaphorical comparisons to physical work. The production of teleodynamic work is, of course, totally dependent on the other forms of work we have been considering. Teleodynamic work depends on morphodynamic work, depends on thermodynamic work. Mental work, for example, requires physiological processes doing thermodynamic work to maintain the constant activity of neurons producing and, transduce and transducing signals, and also the production of spontaneously and non-spontaneously self-organized patterns of neural activity that recursively amplify and damp as they, trans as they traverse complex changing neural networks. What is additionally involved, however, is the generation of new semiotic relationships and new end-directed tendencies in the face of spontaneous, habitual interpretive tendencies and countervailing end-directed processes. In the performance of difficult interpretive processes, for example, we indirectly experience both the energetic demands and the morphological demands of the supporting lower-level forms of work that are also involved. There is the fatigue that is generated by struggling to maintain attention on the interpretive problem until it is solved, and the challenge of trying to find an appropriate translation into other words to, or to conjure up an appropriate mental image among the many spontaneously arising but inadequate alternatives. But although this domain of work necessarily involves the others, it is intuitively not merely reducible to these simpler processes alone, as mere mindless physical labor demonstrates. Thus, the free association of daydreams or the nearly unconscious performance of a highly familiar task are not experienced as mentally effortful, even though they do require metabolic support and the generation of distinct, appropriate patterns of neural activity. So, we intuitively recognize the distinctive, effortful character of teleodynamic work. Although the exercise of mental effort is unquestionably its most familiar exemplar, teleodynamic work occurs in many forms that are neither cognitive or even associated with brains. Before we can hope to understand the processes responsible for teleodynamic work that occurs in and between human brains, we will need to analyze its organizational details and its dependency on other forms of work in some far simpler systems. To do this, we can back down in complexity and familiarity, and at the same time incrementally unplack the complex contributions of other forms of work. One of the most fundamental forms of teledynamic work is that which occurs in the process of biological evolution. This is epitomized by novel functional adaptations and their heritable representations being constantly created where none previously existed. In other words, new teledynamic systems and relationships are generated from the interactions of prior teledynamic systems with respect to their shared environmental contexts. Using natural selection as an exemplar, let's analyze what, what it makes Let's analyze what makes it teleodynamic work using the generic logic that we have outlined above for thermodynamic and morphodynamic work. To begin the analysis, we need to identify what constitutes orthograde and contrograde processes in this teleodynamic domain. In the case of biological evolution, there are two very general classes of orthograde teleodynamic processes. First, there are the actions of organisms that function to maintain them against degrading influences, such as thermodynamic breakdown of macromolecules and degradation of metabolic networks. Second, there are processes of growth, differentiation, and reproduction, which are involved in producing what amount to backup copies of the organism in the form of daughter cells or offspring. These are teleodynamic processes because they are end-directed towards specific target states. They are orthograde because they are what, an or what organism dynamics produce naturally and spontaneously given supportive underlying forms of morphodynamic and thermodynamic work. 
Organisms are, of course, highly complicated synergistic constellations of teleodynamic processes that each collectively contribute some fraction of global teleodynamics of the organism. But for the purpose of this first level of analysis, we can lump all together, we can lump all together as though the life history strategy of the organism is a single orthograde teleodynamic process. In this context, we can identify contricate teleodynamic processes as those that are organized in such a way that impede or contravene these orthograde processes. In other words, contragrade biological teleodynamic processes are those that are in some way bad for the organism and that they are detrimental to survival and reproduction. With respect to evolution, where the critical end is reproductive success and that is sufficient to guarantee continuation of one's lineage, reproductive competition from other members of the species is the most directly relevant source of precisely contragrade influences. In this sense, each organism is doing teleodynamic work against its reproductive competitors. So far, this is intuitively familiar. The work required to meet with other, compete with other organisms at many levels over many kinds of resources in order to achieve diverse ends is in many ways the hallmark experience of being a living organism. But, like other forms of work, Teleodynamic work can also be used to transform one form of teleodynamic process into another and to generate emergent phenomena at a higher order. This is what happens in the process of natural selection. So now, let's describe natural selection in terms of teleodynamic work. In the standard model of natural selection, variants of the same teleodynamic process, adaptive traits, that are represented in the different members of, the species, of a species in one generation are brought into competition over resources critical to reproduction. In this competition of each against all, in the simplest case, work done to acquire resources, mates, and so on is also work that degrades the teleodynamic efficiency of competitors with results of these same requirements. This work is both directly and indirectly a source of distributed contragrade effects on other organisms. Because the teleodynamics of organisms is supported by extensive morphodynamic and thermodynamic work, it is also the case that teleodynamic competition ramifies to all these lower level processes as well. And since all ultimately depend on thermodynamic work, this is the final arbiter of teleodynamic success. Analogous to the way the coupling and juxtaposition of non-concordant orthograde thermodynamic and morphodynamic processes can be utilized to generate specific contragrade patterns of entropy, decrease, and form production, respectively, the complex juxtaposition of non-concordant teleodynamic processes can generate teleodynamic systems that would not otherwise occur. Because the widespread integration of diversely contragrade teleodynamics inter teleodynamic interactions in one generation is mediated through an environment that is also the source for the resources supporting their underlying, underlying morphodynamic and thermodynamic work processes, the constraints and regularities intrinsic to that environment become the analog to the constraints of the engine of an engine for channeling the teleodynamic work into forms consistent with that environment. In biological evolution, this ultimately results in an increasing asymmetry of the presence of these teleodynamic traits in succeeding generations. The differential reproduction and elimination of the less fitted variants from the population in each generation thus has a recursive influence on all levels of work involved, maintaining them in concordance with those constraints. More significantly, due to the inevitable spontaneous thermodynamic degradation of the capacity to do work at the, all these levels, new variant teleodynamic complexes continually arise and are entered into this evolutionary work cycle. The familiar result is the production of increasingly integrated, increasingly diverse, increasingly complex, increasingly well-fitted teleodynamic systems. What we can conclude from this is that evolution is a kind of teleodynamic engine powered by taking advantage of spontaneous thermodynamic, morphodynamic, and teleodynamic processes and which continually generates new teleodynamic processes and relationships. Additionally, because teleodynamic processes are supported by synergistic organization of morphodynamic and thermodynamic work cycles, these two evolve as do the synergies that bind them together into the individual causal loci we know as organisms. Next section, emergent causal powers.
This brings us back to issues discussed in the introductory section of this chapter. We can now make a somewhat more detailed assessment of why there is a difference in the amount of work required to solve a difficult puzzle versus a simple one. Returning to the comparison between two jigsaw puzzles, one with fewer parts, distinctively different shaped pieces, and forming a recognizable and heterogeneously organized picture when assembled, compared to one with more pieces, much more subtle shape differences, and a very homogeneous surface image, we can recognize that much more work at all three levels will be required to assemble the second harder puzzle. More pieces require more physical movements. Less shape distinction between pieces means more errors of fit it will also translate into more movements, as will less pictorial distinctions. Hence, more thermodynamic work is required. But now let's consider the cognitive challenge. The puzzler must generate mental images of each comparison, and will almost certainly generate many times more mental comparisons than actual trial fits. Each mental comparison requires the generation of at least two distinctive forms of neural activity to represent the compared pieces. Since there are inevitably other cognitive and mnemonic tendencies that would otherwise express themselves and could be potential distractions, this is a non-spontaneous process of form generation. This is the source of the feeling of resistance to focusing attention on the problem at hand and generating these highly constrained mental images rather than others. This is then a form of morphodynamic work, contragrade form generation against a background of competing orthograde form generation tendencies. We will talk about how this might be generated in brains in chapter 17. But of course, this requires metabolic energy, thermodynamic work and presumably more energy than is required to let one's thoughts wander in an orthograde stream of consciousness patterns. In fact, this is made unambiguously evident in vivo, in, in, in unambiguously evident in in vivo imaging studies of regional changes of brain metabolism when comparing active versus passive interaction with stimuli. This too will be discussed in more detail in chapter 17. But these forms are not merely forms. They are mental representation of objects being encountered in the context of analyzing and physically assembling the puzzle. The forms as representations are not then merely the results of morphodynamic work, but must be generated with respect to this context and tested against it. As these mental images are being generated, biases from past memory and from expectations will also compete with the generation of representations that are faithful to the task at hand. So there will be innumerable ways that the generation of adequately correspondent representations can go awry. Almost certainly, in the generation of these mental images, there will be multiple partial drafts that are produced and compared against the information provided by the senses. In this process, all but one will be rejected as not sufficiently constrained to correlate with incoming patterns. And this mental generation and testing of imagined comparisons will itself be iterative in advance of actually picking up a piece and trying its fit, looking for physical feedback to be the final arbiter of, of accurate representation. Indeed, this process also must be proceeding at many other levels in parallel, such as the generation of teleodynamic predisposition to continue working on the problem despite distractions and competing demands on one's time. This generation and selection process is an expression of teleodynamic work, and given that it requires the generation, comparison, and context-sensitive elimination of vastly many partially developed early drafts of the mental representations involved, each of these was a product of morphodynamic work, and so on. So the level of work that must take place is significantly amplified with the puzzle difficulty. In short, it takes more work at all levels. But notice that this is far more efficient than randomly picking up pieces and testing their physical fit. This shift of work up levels, so to speak, significantly decreases the total amount of thermodynamic work to achieve this end, and thermodynamic work is what supports the base of the whole hierarchy. As this one simple example illustrates, the domain opened by teleodynamic work is enormous. The diversity of forms of teleodynamic work is as extensive as the fields of biology, psychology, human social behavior, and the arts combined. Not only is it far beyond the scope of this book, much less this chapter to do more than cherry pick a few illustrative examples of this process, a thorough analysis of teleodynamic work in such cases would likely be redundant and superficial compared to analyses pursued in these many specialized fields. Indeed, one might argue that throughout this chapter we have been merely redescribed we have merely redescribed selective phenomena drawn from the domains of mechanics, acoustics, evolutionary theory, and now cognitive and behavioral science in terms of the concept of work. But if this were merely redescription and renaming of otherwise well understood phenomena, there would be little to gain over knowledge gained in those already well explored territories.
what I hope this analysis, analysis accomplishes is not the introduction of conceptual tools to replace those already employed in the various sciences we have touched upon, but rather a roadmap for following the common threads that links these hetero, hith, hetero disconnected and independent realms. What has been missing is a full understanding of how the power to affect change at all levels is interconnected and interdependent. I believe that, that something like this expansion and generalization of the concept of work is the critical first step. One important contribution of this perspective is that it untangles the notion of causal power from undifferentiated notions of causality. Whereas our common si commonplace conceptions of cause tend to be applied willy-nilly to all matter of physical changes, attributions of causal power are typically invoked in a more restricted sense. I believe that this distinction parallels the distinction explored in this chapter between changes due to work and changes in general. The addition of the term power is the clue that the issue has to do with work and not just with causality in general. In other words, it invokes a sense of overcoming resistance, of forcing things to change in ways they wouldn't otherwise change, and this is what is important to us. It is the emergent capacity to reorganize natural processes in ways that would never spontaneously occur, which is what we have been struggling to understand with respect to life and with respect to mind. The term causal power has become particularly associated with debates about emergence, emergence and mental agency. For example, contentious debates about the status of human agency and the efficacy of mental representations are not merely concerned with whether physical change of state occur in conditions associated with this phenomena. They concern the question of whether their status as these they concern the question of their status as sources of work that is the production of non-spontaneous change in some conditions. So, while there is no serious debate over whether mental events are associated with such physical events as the release of neurotransmitter molecules or the propagation of action potentials down neuronal axons, there is concern about whether the effects of mental experience are anything more than this, and whether the experience of mental effort really plays any role in initiating physical changes in the world not otherwise attributable to the spontaneous consequences of physiological chemistry and locomotor physics. Putting these issues in the context of an expanded theory of work, we can appreciate that although the physiological changes do in fact involve, for example, molecular interactions, the real challenge is determining in what way a person's spontaneous molecular formative and indirective processes have combined to produce non-spontaneous mechanical, organizational, and semiotic changes. The issue is not whether the changes introduced into the world due to a person's considered actions are caused or not, of course they are, but whether there is something physically non-spontaneous about the effect. Debates concerning the status of human conscious agency are about the proper locus of this causal power. Causal power is also a code word for what is presumed to be added to the causal architecture of the universe as a result of, emergent, of an emergent transition. But, as we've seen, when this idea is conflated with more generic notions of causality, it yields a troubling implication that such phenomena as life and cognition might be changing or adding to the fundamental physical laws and constants, or at least be capable of modifying them. The preserved restriction against this is a postulate of causal closure discussed in Chapter 5. We can now readdress this, problem, this issue more precisely. Although the fundamental constants and laws of physics do not change, and there is no gain or loss of mass energy during any physical transformational process, there can be quite significant alterations in the organizational nature of causal processes. Specifically, work can restructure the constraints acting as boundary conditions that determine what patterns of change will be orthograde in some other linked system. This is the generation of new formal causal conditions, and because the resulting orthograde dynamics will determine the possible forms of work that can result, it sets the stage for the emergence of unprecedented organizations of efficient causality and so forth, with the, genera with the generation of yet further new constraints and new forms of work. As we have seen, this can also occur in ascending levels of, uh, in ascending levels of dynamics with correlated increase in possibilities of organizational complexity. So, to restate the closure or conservation laws a bit more carefully, the universe is closed to a gain or loss of mass energy, and the most basic level of formal causality is unchanging, but it is open to organizational constraints on formal cause and the introduction of novel forms of efficient cause. Thus, we have causal openness even in a universe that is equi the equivalent of a completely isolated system. New forms of work can and are constantly emerging.
The concept of causal power is also of particular interest to social scientists, since it has become a critical issue for discussing the capacity for semiotic processes to control behavior and shape the worldview of whole cultures. Indeed, it is often argued that the very nature of the interpretive process is subject to the whims of, the, of power of he Indeed, it is often argued that the very nature of the interpretive process is subject to the whims of the power of hegemonic semiotic influence. The problem has been that although this sort of power is an intuitively recognized and commonplace feature of human experience, it is at least as difficult to define as the concepts like interpretation as sorry. It is at least as difficult to define the, as the concepts like interpretation that are supposed to be grounded in it. This difficulty may be mitigated by recasting this notion of power in terms of teleodynamic work. Specifically, as we have seen, teleodynamic work is defined contra to orthograde teleodynamic processes. In cognitive terms, orthograde teleodynamic processes may be expressed as goal-directed, innate adaptive behaviors, spontaneous emotional tendencies, learned unconscious patterns of behavior, stream of consciousness word associations, and so forth. In social terms, Orthograde teleodynamic processes may be expressed as common cultural narratives for explaining events, habits of communication developed between different groups or classes of individuals, conventionalized patterns of exchange, and so on. As a result, we can easily recognize how it is that these orthograde predispositions to change might come into contact, why they might encounter resistance, and how they might become specifically linked to afford transformation of work from one domain to another, or become engaged in a form of semiotic and social evolutionary dynamic. As we will see in subsequent chapters, these predispositions and the work that can be generated thereby are the basis for the generation of new forms of teleodynamic relationships, that is, new information and new representations. In fact, the very concept of interpretation can be cashed out in terms of teleodynamic work. This will be the subject of the next two chapters. In conclusion, being able to trace the thread of causality that links these domains avails us the ability to discern whether methods and concepts developed in different scientific contexts, contexts are transferable more than merely analogous forms. It also makes it possible to begin the task of formalizing the relationships that link energetic processes, form generation processes, and social cognitive processes. Most important, it shows us that what emerges in new levels of dynamics is not any new fundamental law of physics or any singularity in the causal connectedness of physical phenomena, but rather the possibility of new forms of work and thus new ways to achieve what would not otherwise occur spontaneously. In other words, with the emergence of new forms of work, the causal organization of the world changes fundamentally, even though the basic laws of nature remain the same. Causal linkages that were previously cosmically improbable, such as the special juxtapositions of highly purified metals and semiconductors con constituting the computer that is recording this text, become highly predictable. This causal generativity is a consequence of the fact that higher order forms of work can organize the generation of non-spontaneous patterns of physical change into vast constellations of linked forms of work connecting large numbers of otherwise unrelated physical systems spanning many levels of interdependent dynamics. Although I've only described three major classes of work corresponding to thermodynamics, morphodynamics, and teleodynamics, it should be obvious from previous discussions of levels of emergent dynamics that there is no limit to higher order forms of teleodynamic processes. Thus, the possibility of generating increasingly diverse forms of non-spontaneous dynamics can produce causal relationships that radically diverge from simple physical and chemical explanation expectations and yet still have these processes as their ground. This is the essence of emergence and the creative explosion it unleashes. All right, that's the end of that chapter. Thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.